All right, um, so here we are. There, there seemed um, early in the class, I, I did a survey, um, and there did seem like there was um, some fairly uh, unanimous, um, close to universal interest, and at least like a little bit of an introduction to time series. So um, obviously you could make an entire class out of this. Um, and in fact, we are offering an entire class over the summer. Um, I just know the vast majority of you are graduating in May and most likely not taking that class, although I do know at least one of you, right, Jason, I'm calling you out, um, is cool and hip enough to take the time series class over the summer. So um, I'll probably just do maybe two PowerPoints. Um, this first one's going to be kind of like a kind of big picture introduction to kind of what time series is and kind of some of the unique considerations involved in it. Uh, probably the second PowerPoint is going to be focused on probably the most widely used um, time series technique, which is ARIMA modeling, to kind of get you um, a little bit familiar with that. Um, and then we'll kind of see from there. I may or may not do a third um, PowerPoint. Um, it, might, it would be nice to give you some extra depth. Um, I do think this is like a really useful technique. I see right forecasting time series or remodeling um, as like kind of like a, a required or preferred skill in a lot of jobs so I do think this is a really valuable skill set to have um, but I'd also like to get you some exposure to some other topics as well and sadly uh, sadly our semester is starting to wind down so we'll get at least two and then kind of reevaluate from there so time series um, is pretty straightforward in fact I think we've actually kind of talked um, maybe in the first lecture of our class about right a little bit what time series is and we even talked about like how how it's different from say something um, similar like longitudinal analysis um, time series is really just the analysis of data at different points of time right but in such a way that we have only a single observation at any particular time point right different than longitudinal where we often have multiple observations at different time points we typically conceptualize time series as a regression, as a 512 model, where the time t is our independent variable, right? So <clears throat> in a lot of ways, it's kind of like simple linear regression. Um, it's just instead of y equals beta naught plus beta 1x, we write y equals beta naught plus beta 1t because our explanatory variable, our independent variable, is 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 time. Uh, lots of examples, right? So um, stock prices over time, right, would be an example of time series. Uh, inventory um, of a particular product over time would be um, an example of time series. Um, economic indicators like inflation levels over time, um, again, could be modeled through time series. Uh, gas prices, so like price of different commodities. Um, it's also used fairly, um, fairly regularly in like um, kind of like forestry type examples, ecology type examples. So um, if you wanted to measure water levels over time, that would also be time series um, or like populations of a particular type of animal, maybe like adorable koala bears, for example, um, right? That, that could be modeled through time series. Um, I've seen a lot of like like scientific analyses, right? Um, kind of in this day and age, I guess, like a little bit of a political hot button issue, right? Is there climate change? Is there not climate change? Is there global warming? Is there not global warming? Uh, most of what I've read in terms of like scientific or statistical literature seems to suggest that there is. Um, and a lot of the analyses that I've seen are kind of time series types analyses. So Right, we could look at temperature over time. Um, and kind of as we've already talked about, things like blood pressure or brain waves over time um, are typically more, more commonly modeled with like longitudinal analysis. Because typically, um, you, if you're measuring blood pressure, you probably have multiple patients, which means that, that you have multiple observations at different time points. So it falls into that longitudinal analysis framework. Now, I say that a time series model is just like kind of like the most basic simple linear regression model from 512. But I mean, that's 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 oversimplifying it because there are some complications. 
the first and, and really kind of the most um, the most pesky, the most troublesome complication is that our errors and hence our y values are typically not independent, right? We think of our 512 assumptions, a mean of zero, a common variance, a normal distribution, and of course that 4th of July assumption, independence. That 4th of July assumption is typically violated. Our errors, our y's are typically not independent of one another. That is, right, the, the koala bear population today in some way depends on what it was yesterday. And of course, similarly, koala population tomorrow depends on what it is today. We also often have seasonal or cyclical patterns to identify, quantify, and in some cases actually try to remove. Right, so we have often what's like what's referred to as like seasonality, right? So I mean, the easiest and most common example, right, is that if you're kind of looking at maybe like sales of ice cream, right, you have this kind of almost like this sort of sinusoidal kind of pattern that is ice cream sales are always a little higher than average, right, in the summer months and lower than average in uh, the winter months, right? Despite the ice cream industry's best attempts to bring us delicious winter flavors like eggnog and uh, and peppermint. And then also finally, right, our predictions, our forecasts, our extrapolations, right? Remember, we talked about this idea of interpolation and extrapolation in STAT 512, right? We said that any prediction within your range of X values, so here we're talking within our range of T values, would be an interpolation, but anything making predictions for outside our range of T is extrapolating, right? But in this particular case, we wouldn't care about interpolation, agreed? That is, if we have, say, data for a time one through time 50, we're not interested in making a prediction for time for something between 1 and 50, right? We don't need to predict what the stock price is at time 30. We know what it was at time 30. We want to predict what it's going to be at time 51, and that's outside of our observed data. It's an extrapolation. Remember, we said extrapolations in 512 are inherently dangerous. Here's something fun to kind of drive that danger home. So I, I found like a, an entire book on, on bad predictions. And here's, here's just a few of them that kind of I thought were interesting. So, um, right, here's, here's a bad prediction from, I guess, probably looks like some French encyclopedia in 1756. They said, the population is constant in size and will remain so right up to the end of mankind. Now, I don't know what the population was in 1756, but I suspect that it's considerably higher today than it was back then. All right here's here's a here's a bit of a blunder, um, right? The U.S. Department of Labor, so our our own sort of government, our own statisticians, uh, back in uh, 1929, right, made the made the cheerful forecast that 1930 will be a splendid employment year, and of course that was right before the uh, the infamous October uh, crash. And then here's right our beloved Wall Street Journal, right? The the bible of all of our of us. Uh, business-minded statisticians came up with this pretty cool uh, forecast. Um, I, I feel like their first sentence is, uh, this may be reasonably true, computers are multiplying at a rapid rate. By the turn of the century, so by the year 2000, there will be as many as 220,000 computers in the U.S. Could you imagine? Wow. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to extrapolate. It's hard to right make predictions of what's going to happen in the future so the sort of simplest starting point for for a for a um, for a time series model is what we call a trend model a trend model describes y sub t as a function of some average level or trend which we're going to abbreviate with capital tr and of course, always some error term, right? Because our, 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 we're never working with something that's like purely deterministic. 
We try to think of the errors as IID. IID, remember, means independent, identically distributed, right? With a normal distribution, mean of zero, common variant sigma squared. So our usual 512 assumptions whenever possible. But as we'll see, in most time series settings, that independence part is often unrealistic. Right, so our model would be y sub t equals that trend component plus the error component. Right, and of course, there's all kinds of different trends. Um, right, no trend would just be a flat line, right? That is, the trend is just some beta naught, right, again, plus some error term. So, um, right, that would look like a bunch of observations fluctuating around a flat line. Uh, a linear trend, right, we're certainly familiar with from 512, and even a quadratic trend. We talked about polynomial models in 512, so, right, we could have a trend that has, like, a little bit of curvature to it, maybe even kind of reversing direction at some point. So, like, these are the types of trends. Usually we're looking at, at some type of polynomial trend is really what we're looking at, although at the end of this PowerPoint, we'll also look at, um, right, some um, exponential trends as well. So when we're trying to fit a trend model, well, what do we do? First thing we do, just like in 512, right? One of the nice things about time series models is we usually only have a single explanatory variable that we're focused on. So like unlike multiple linear regression where we're working in this like k-dimensional space that's hard to visualize, in a time series setting, we're almost always working in a two-dimensional space. And so we should always take advantage of that by starting with scatter plots, right? Make a scatter plot of t by y and look at that scatter plot. And usually that helps us get a sense of what the underlying trend might be. The second thing, as I said, right, whenever possible, we'd like to assume that these errors are independent, but we should check, we should verify whether or not that's true. And like we talked about in 512, the, a nice initial step to doing that is to look at our residual plots. So we're gonna look at our residual plots. Um, what is it we're looking for? Well, we're looking for potential indicators of dependency so, so what might this dependency look like? Well, one way of modeling dependency is referred to as first order autocorrelation. So in this situation, an error at time t relates to that at time t minus one through the following equation, right? So we have this e sub t and it's, that's the Greek letter phi. So it's phi times e sub t minus one. And then plus like a little bit of noise, right? So the errors are not perfectly predicted by previous errors, right? But, right, kind of like we have the sort of there on average, the previous error times phi with a little bit of noise. That noise is that a sub t. And we do model that noise as being independent. So the a sub t's, we do allow, or we do typically assume and model that they're independent, identically distributed, the usual 512 assumptions. We also typically think of that phi as being constant. That is the phi does not depend on t. So we have this first order autocorrelation equation. Um, probably, I mean, you could always pause these PowerPoints. You could even rewind these PowerPoints. Might be worth pausing it, um, going back to that equation, just writing it down on a piece of paper, just so you can kind of kind of look at that equation as I talk through it in these subsequent slides. Um, anytime that phi is positive, we call that positive first order autocorrelation. And so here, a positive error is more likely to be followed by a positive error. Similarly, a negative error is more likely to be followed by a negative error. Again, you should be able to look at the equation and see that, right? So if phi is positive, if that, if that e sub t minus 1 is positive, well, a positive number times a positive number, that should be positive. And if that e sub t minus one, if the error at time t minus one was negative, well, a negative times a positive is still negative, right? So, right, if you look at that equation 
and you and you have a positive fee, it should make sense to us kind of what we're talking about here. Positive errors or positive residuals are followed by positive residuals. Negative residuals are followed by negative residuals. A lot, there's a lot of examples. Probably, like, probably most, like, real life examples fall into, like, this positive autocorrelation framework, right? I think maybe we've talked about this in at least one of our classes, but again, like imagine kind of the idea is what, like, so what would a positive residual be? A positive residual would be like um, that the observed value was more than we expected it to be. So if we're talking about like stock price, right, the stock price or the value of a particular company was more than we expected it to be. And so there's always this question is like, okay, well, if it is, there should be a reason. Why? Why is it more than expected? Well, right, uh, maybe it's a good economy. Maybe that's part of why it's, it's doing better than expected. Um, maybe it had a really successful advertising campaign, right? Maybe that's part of why it's better than expected. Maybe it just released a new product, right? Maybe that's why it's better than expected. Now, whatever sort of, whatever conspiracy of circumstance, right, conspired to 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 make this stock sort of overperform to do better than we predicted it should those same conspiracy of circumstances are probably at play tomorrow right that is it's probably still a good economy tomorrow right the advertising campaign is still probably effective tomorrow the new product is still new ish tomorrow and so we would still expect probably another positive residual right and, and so on and so on. Now, of course, Fortuna's wheel is always turning, always turning. And so, I mean, at some point, right, at some point, the economy is not so good. Maybe the world catches coronavirus. Um, what was a, a well-received advertising campaign is now overplayed and is actually kind of like nauseating and annoying. The new product is now obsolete. And so now maybe this stock is underperforming, right? It's doing worse than expected. And again, right, the same things that are making it do worse than expected are still at play the next day and the next day. So we tend to have a run of negative autocorrelations, creating this kind of like sinusoidal type um, residual plot. So here's something that I simulated um, in R. If you want to play around with it, um, the R code, I believe, is posted on D2L. I'm not going to, when we were going to do an in-person lab, I was going to kind of do some cool exercises with this. Um, now that we don't have the luxury of in-person labs, I'll probably just let that be. Uh, but, uh, excuse me, but my R code is on D2L if you want to just play around with it. Um, this was a simulation I did, 100 observations, um, so we can think of that as like 100 time points. Um, and this used a fee of positive 0.9. So, right, we kind of see, um, right, particularly, what is that, between like maybe time point, like, um, I don't know, like maybe five to 25, it's like all above, it's all positive residuals and it dips below for a while, negative residuals and it jumps up, positive residuals, right? The negative, positive, then we have a really long run of negative residuals. And then right at time point 100, it looks like it pops up to some positive residuals, All right? So that's the type of residual plot that we would expect to see. That's the type of residual plot that would be indicative of positive autocorrelation. So negative first order autocorrelation occurs when our fee is negative, right? So anytime our fee is negative, we have negative first order autocorrelation. Again, you should be able to sort of see and verify algebraically that now a positive error will tend to be followed by a negative error. A negative error will tend to be followed by a positive error, right? If the error at time t minus one was positive, it's being multiplied by a negative coefficient, a negative phi, which means that the error at, at time point today will now be negative. Um, kind of the example you see like in textbooks are like inventory type examples. So, um, right, it's like a big sale. Um, 
And so you 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 order um, whatever big sale on toilet paper. So you order a bunch of toilet paper. So you have a you have a really high inventory of toilet paper. But of course it's a sale, so everyone like buys all your toilet paper, and now you're like cleaned out. You have very little toilet paper. So you had a lot, maybe more than average. Now you have very little, maybe less than average. And then you do another sale. Now you have more than average, and then you're cleaned out. Now you're less than average. So I, I'm not really sure if that really translates in the real world, because I mean, I, you know, that's kind of implying that things are constantly going on and off sale. And I, I think there's long periods of time where things aren't on sale. Um, but I guess in, in an environment where things are constantly on sale, maybe that would work. Um, <laughs> I say number of falls per month at a diabetics ward of a hospital. Um, I, I was in a hospital once and um, I saw a poster, like a kind of academic poster that um, I think one of the nurses had actually put together, um, which was kind of cool. And I was looking at it and it was like the sort of time series graph um, of like the number of falls um, in their particular wing or ward. And, and they just plotted these points. There wasn't a lot of them, maybe like maybe like 12. And they fit a line to those points. And so by fitting the line, I was able to see like, okay, like it, it actually was interesting. The points like really did fluctuate right back and forth. It was above the line, then below the line, above the line, below the line, above the line, below the line. That's what negative autocorrelation looks like. So it was like it was like a real life example that was like beautifully, like perfectly, very, very strong negative autocorrelation. I tried really hard to get in contact with like the the author of that poster, but I wasn't able to, sadly. Um, so I, I was psyched when I saw it. But I, I, maybe it makes a little bit of sense. Maybe does that make sense? So I guess the idea is like I think like they implemented some kind of protocol, right, to make people fall less. And so it kind of makes sense that like you start this like regimen, you start this protocol, everyone's like really gung ho. They're following the protocols really, really well. And because they're doing it, the number of falls is less than expected. But I mean, we're human beings, right? We can't stay hyper vigilant forever. You can't be on your A game, right? Continuously at some point, like everything's working and you get this kind of false sense of security and you slack off a little bit, right? And you slack off a little bit and now there's some more falls, more than expected. And then because there's more falls, you're like, crap, I gotta get my act together, right? And so now you're back to being hypervigilant and now there's less falls than expected. But again, you can't stay hypervigilant forever and so, so on. So, I mean, I, I have seen a real life example like that, maybe a surprising one. I'm not sure if that's uh, an exception or a rule in this type of context, um, but still kind of interesting to see. So here's what this would look like. It's actually like a little tricky, right? Because actually, to be honest, probably most of us would look at that. It's easy for us to like see it with, the, with our eyes. It's easy for humans to perceive positive autocorrelation. It's hard for us, I think, to perceive negative autocorrelation because this actually does look random, doesn't it? But this is a, this is a residual plot with a with a very strong negative autocorrelation. This was a, a fee of negative 0.9. That is, this is basically going from negative to positive to negative to positive, negative to positive, negative to positive, negative to positive, right? More than we would expect it to. So, and again, this is hard to see with your eyes, but but if by pure randomness, you would not expect it to keep crossing that, that line of zero over and over and over and over, right? You would expect it to be kind of a blend of this and a blend of what we saw in the positive um, autocorrelation uh, plot. Yeah, so in practice, uh, positive first order autocorrelation occurs much more frequently than negative first order autocorrelation. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing. What happens when that absolute value of phi is less than one. Well, let's take a look on the next slide. So here it's just kind of like a, I'm just like applying a recursive relationship. So here I just picked a fee like 0.5. It's less than one, right? So, so E sub T is 0.5 times E sub T minus one plus that A sub T. Now I'm just applying that same recursive relationship to E sub T minus one, right? I could write, e sub t minus 1 
is equal to, well, equal to exactly what's inside that parentheses, agreed? Same recursive relationship. E sub t minus 1 equals 0.5, E sub t minus 2 plus A sub t minus 1. So I just do a substitution. I kind of multiply through, and now what do I have? I have, right, that E sub t depends, so the error at time t depends on the error two time periods back, but less so than it did on one period back, right? It, it, it had a weight of 0.5 in terms of how much it was related to one time period back. It has a weight of half that, 0.25. And of course, if I, I'll leave it to you if you want to, to apply this relationship again, then you would see something like E sub T is equal to, well, what's half of, of 0.25? Half of 0.25, I think, is 0.125. So, right, it would be E sub T equals 0.125 times E sub T minus 3. And then it would be half that, and then it would be half that, and it would be half that. So I think this is like an intuitive idea, right? That, right, the error most directly relates to the most recent time period. It does technically also have dependency to time periods before that, but in a diminishing fashion, right? So what we can see mathematically, assuming phi is, has an absolute value less than one, is we see this diminishing dependency. As we move further and further and further back in time, the dependency is less and less and less and less. I mean, that's an algebraic mathematical fact, but I think it's a mathematical fact that reflects a very intuitive concept. So, it's nice to look at a graph, but it would be also nice, maybe even nicer, right, to have something a little bit like numeric, right? Graphs are great, a picture speaks a thousand words, but, but A, we saw negative autocorrelation is difficult to see with your eye, and even like positive autocorrelation can sometimes be like like not as striking as the graph that I made. You could look at it and say, well, it looks like maybe there's some positive autocorrelation, but I'm not sure. That is like pictures can sometimes feel like a little bit subjective. That's why it's nice to have something a little bit more black and white, something a little bit more concrete, something a little bit more objective, something numerical. The numerical measurement for first order autocorrelation is referred to as the Durbin-Watson test statistic. And so there's the formula right there. All right, so here I, I, I've been saying E, it's really epsilons, right, in all the previous slides. The epsilons are the true errors. The E's here um, are our residuals, right? Our residuals are our best guesses, our estimates for those theoretical errors. It's not immediately obvious, um, but the Durbin-Watson test statistic is, is always between zero and four. I mean, actually, the fact that it can never be negative should make sense to us, right? Everything's being squared, so there's no possibility for that test statistic to be zero, or to be negative, sorry. So a lower bound of zero makes sense. The upper bound of four is maybe not obvious, but um, if you want to Google it, you can Google it. The proof is actually not that hard to see that it is also bounded by four. Um, now, <coughs> what should hopefully make a little bit of sense to us is kind of what I have there on the bottom. So small values of the Durbin-Watson test statistic indicate positive autocorrelation. A large Durbin-Watson test statistic indicates negative autocorrelation. Does that make sense? Really, kind of like where that's all coming from is the numerator, right? All of the magic's happening upstairs. So, right, we have e sub t minus e sub t minus 1. Remember, subtraction's a distance operator. So we're basically saying how far is e sub t from e sub t minus 1. Now, positive autocorrelation means if one's positive, the other's positive. If one's negative, the other's negative. And so in that sense, they're close to each other, right? And so their difference their distance is relatively small. Hence, we would expect a small Durbin-Watson test statistic. If it's negative autocorrelation, 
right? One of those we expect to be positive, one of those we expect to be negative, right? They're on opposite sides of zero, that is, they're sort of far away from each other. And so we expect it to be large, right? That should hopefully make a little bit of sense to us. Yeah, and then here's what I already said about it being bounded between zero and four. Uh, we can compute the Durbin-Watson test statistic and actually some p-values as well in proc reg with the following uh, model y equals time slash dw. Um, and if you want to get the actual p-values, then you do slash dw prob. Um, this has to be, as I said, that it has to be in proc reg. I don't believe that proc glm has these dw uh, functionalities in it. We could actually generalize this. Well, we could test for up to kth order um, autocorrelation using proc auto reg. I think we've had some exposure to proc auto reg in some previous classes or previous lectures. Um, using model uh, y equals time dw equals k, right? So maybe you think that um, it's not the error today, depends on the error yesterday. Maybe the error today you think depends on the error four time periods back. You can do dw equals four. Okay, so that that's that talks about trend. Um, it talks about errors and 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 one type of dependency, this first order autocorrelation. Now I want to talk about um, we talked about right this, the potential of seasonality in our models. So let's talk about this idea of seasonality or seasonal variation. So many time series have the seasonal trend component to them. The seasonal trend can have constant or increasing decreasing variation. So it can either have constant variation or this increasing decreasing variation. Here's a picture of what increasing variation would look like, right? So right, we see this sort of this sort of seasonal cyclical pattern. But the variation in that pattern is growing over time, isn't it? Usually when you have like something that's increasing, like a line with a positive slope, you'll see increasing variation. And then if instead we had a line with a with a decreasing slope, if we had a line going down, that's when you would typically see maybe decreasing variation. This is what constant variation would look like, right? That is, we see this kind of repetitive cyclical seasonal pattern. But the, the variation in that pattern, right? And by variation, we're really kind of just talking about what? Like, like the distance from like trough to peak is relatively constant. Now, why do I care about this? Well, a lot, most, most statistical analyses of time series data require constant seasonal variation when in truth, in practice, they often have that increasing or decreasing seasonal variation. So what do we do in such a case? If, if our modeling process requires constant seasonal variation, but our data has increasing seasonal variation, what do I do? Well, I, I use a familiar trick, right? A, a familiar Band-Aid that I learned in 512, I apply a transformation. Instead of, instead of the variable y, I use the variable y star, where y star is just our, my original variable y raised to some power, right, some power lambda. Often we use like a lambda of one half, so that's the square root, or a lambda of one fourth, that would be the, I guess, the quartic root maybe. Uh, Although another very common transformation is just the log transformation. And again, we kind of talked about this in 512, right? Sometimes a particular transformation isn't sufficient, doesn't get the job done. Sometimes it's over, um, it's over sufficient. It like, it over transforms the data, like turns increasing variation into decreasing variation, for example. 
the recommendation is to try a few, maybe all three of these. Try a square root, try a quartic root, try a log, and see which of these three seems to actually fix it the most or the best. In fact, actually, the, the previous two things, I actually stole them from the internet, the, um, the picture of constant seasonal variation and increasing seasonal variation. And you may or may not have noticed, if not, you can go back and take a look. Actually, those graphs refer to like some variable past, whatever that is. That's the increasing seasonal variation. And actually, the graph of constant seasonal variation is, it says it's just a log of past. So, right, my example of constant seasonal variation was actually just, just transforming the increased seasonal variation. So, right, those two slides actually also show us like how a log transformation can change our data effectively. So I can combine this with what I talked about before and create a seasonal trend model, right? I could say Y sub T has this overall trend, right? Maybe this overall linear trend that has this cyclical seasonal component and again, always some error term. So now I have a slightly more complicated model, but one of course that allows me to more effectively, more accurately, more truthfully model, of course, the complicated real world in which I live. Now, how do we model that seasonal part? Well, we could model um, constant seasonal variation in a number of different ways. Right, dummy variables and trigonometric functions. So it's kind of—I I think it's cool, right? We normally think that that trigonometry is not used in statistics, but right, it is. I, I don't see it done a lot, but I have seen. I have seen sine functions or cosine functions um, actually directly embedded inside a model equation to model this type of cyclical behavior. But probably what's more commonly done, or at least. What I've seen more commonly or more frequently is the use of dummy variables, which I'll talk about for just a couple slides. But of course, dummy variables we're familiar with from 512, and there's really nothing more to them than what we've learned in 512. Yeah, so assume there are L periods to a particular cycle, right? Whatever our cycle is. So if you're talking about days in a week, then your L is seven. If you're talking about quarters in a year, your L is four. If you're talking about months in a year, your L is 12. Often we're looking at periods in a year. So you're looking at something like months or quarters. Yeah, so in that case, a model equation for L time periods would look like this. Remember, if we have L time periods, we actually only need L minus one dummy variables. Right? So I just have all these different uh, coefficients. If we think of this as like monthly data, I would have like, like a beta for month one, a beta for month two, a beta for month 11, and of course, maybe nothing for month 12, right? That would make what? That would make December our reference category. And then the X's are just all dummy variables. Right? It's... It's one, so that, that first dummy variable is one if we're talking about January, zero otherwise. The second one would be one if we're talking about February, zero, zero otherwise. Right? It's, our, it's, it's our usual approach to dummy variables. Yeah, so here I do an example, right? So um, here I, I do, actually I combine them, right? So this would be an example of what a model would look like, quadratic trend with monthly seasonality, right? And so here it looks like I'm making December my reference category. Does that make sense? So look it over, right? I mean, that, that, that should, based on 512, right, make sense to us. If not, all right, shoot me an email um, and, and we can kind of talk it over. So how do we code dummy variables in SAS, right? This is kind of like a nice way of doing it. I'm not sure that we've done anything quite like this in 512. Right, because we'll see like a lot of times like you'll get a data set. Um, a lot of the data sets that I've, I've found at least, right, they, they don't always have like just the month. If, if they had the month, then that would be great. Um, but a lot of them just have like the time. So right here, what we're basically saying is like this, this, this code 
is like kind of assuming you just have two variables in your data set, a Y variable and a time variable. And that time variable is just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. And so if that's the case, right, how do I create these dummy variables? And that's where this mod function comes in. So this mod is just kind of like in division, right? The mod is basically you take that time, you divide it by 12, and you look at the remainder. If the remainder is 1, we're talking about January. So since that's January, we set M1, the dummy variable for month 1, equal to 1. And we set um, otherwise, if it's not January, we set it equal to 0. Right? If, if, if the mod is 2, that means, right, if we divide time by 12 and the remainder is 2, that means we're in February. So we set the... We set the February indicator to one. Otherwise, if it's not two, then it's not February. So we set it equal to zero, right? And we can keep doing that. So kind of like a neat little trick that uh, that mod function is is kind of a useful one to know um, any type you have to deal with this type of data. All right, and then the last thing I wanted to do is just is just kind of briefly show that that I mean often we can get by. Very often we can get by with modeling trends with polynomials, but there are situations where we might do something a little bit more complicated. One of those is this kind of exponential growth curve model. So a growth curve model would look like y sub t equals beta naught times beta 1 to the power t times um, that error, that epsilon t. Now, this is not linear in its parameters which means that we cannot use the usual 512 techniques. You know, creates a problem. So how do we get around this problem? How do we how do we get around this problem of nonlinearity? It turns out the answer is we take the natural log. <coughs> Excuse me. So we could see quite clearly, right? If I take the log of the left and the log of the right, <clears throat> Remember, the log of a product is the sum of the logs, right? So if I take the log of that right-hand side, I have the log of beta naught plus, here I did two steps, it's technically plus the log of beta 1 to the power t, but another property of logs is I can move that t, so it's log of beta 1 to the power t, but I can move that t outside of the log plus the log of that of that epsilon. And now this looks a lot more like a 512 model, doesn't it? The log of beta naught is just some constant. Let's call that constant, say, alpha naught. The log of beta 1, again, is just some constant. Let's call that constant alpha 1. And then, right, the log of some random variable, the log of some random error is still just some random error. All right, so if I just kind of relabel things, it looks a lot like a 512 model, just using log y instead of y. I have sort of linearized um, my exponential growth. So the growth rate of an exponential model is defined to be 100 times beta 1 minus 1%. Now, of course, we typically don't know what beta 1 is, so we replace it with beta 1 hat. We can also conceptualize beta naught as an initial quantity. So a forest is known to have, <coughs> so here's an example. Say that we have a forest, it's known to have 5,000 bears, and we know that bears are known to have a growth rate of 25%. So in this case, a growth curve to statistically model their population growth would look like, right? So the initial thing, the beta naught is 5,000. That growth rate is 1.25, right? Because uh, 1.25 1, uh, minus 1 gives me 0.25, and then times 100 gives me that 25%. Raise that to the power t, and of course, I have to put my error term in there. Let me say this. Um, 
as of now, I'm leaning towards, um, and I'm going to think about it a little bit, and, and I'll email you if I decide to do this. I'm thinking about actually having like a final exam. And the final exam will maybe ask like maybe like one very simple question from each week's PowerPoints. Um, and I'll give you a heads up in each PowerPoint, like what the question will be. It's really just like my way of just like sort of making sure that you're actually like doing the work and listening to the lectures. And, you know, I guess engaging with them enough that you could solve a relatively simple problem. So if I were to make a question on a final exam based off this week's PowerPoint, it would probably be something like this slide right here, where maybe I would say, well, maybe a forest has 9,000 bears, and the bears are known to have a growth rate of 30%. Why don't you tell me what the growth curve would look like? All right, so just to give you a heads up, if there is a final, I'm still thinking about it. Of course, I'll let you know if there's going to be one, right? The question, I'll probably just do one question from each week's lecture, right? The question from this week's lecture. But again, I, I want to keep it very simple. The only goal is just to like make sure that you're that you're listening to these things. So it would be some question along the lines of this, this PowerPoint right here, or this slide right here. All right, so that kind of wraps up our introduction to time series analysis. Um, we're going to talk about a more complicated way of modeling things, um, actually a pretty, a very complicated thing. Um, called a REMA modeling. Um, we'll see how effectively I can I can squeeze it into just kind of a one week's um, kind of worth of content, and then we'll kind of decide or I'll decide from there uh, whether or not I want to do a third week um, going deeper or not. All right, but regardless, for now you're done with this first week. Um, should be a lab, so make sure you do that, and then um, of course, right, make a little note to yourself to look at the slide before the final if in fact we have one. All right, toodaloo.